we welcome you to Grove Church to our seven last things tonight. Is anybody excited about what God is going to do tonight? That's why I'm going to hurry up and get out of the way because I'm excited. We have seven dynamic preachers. But before we do that, we're going to call them up. Before we do that, we just want to set the scene. This is what we call Good Friday, right? And somebody might ask the question, why do we call it Good Friday? Because it was good for us that Jesus would not come down from the cross just to save himself. But what he decided, he decided to die just to save you and me. And so that is why we come here tonight. That is why we gather tonight to, to listen and to hear those seven last expressions of what Jesus said on the cross. So when we call these preachers up, we're expecting a word from the Lord. It's not about who can out-preach the other. We eliminate in all forms of competition. But what we come here tonight is to hear what thus said the Lord. And I'm excited about that. Anybody excited about it? Hallelujah. So we welcome you here tonight. And we're going to jump right in. I am excited. First off, we're going to have Dr. Charity Fisher from Greater Revival Church in Virginia Beach. She's going to give us our first saying, which is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. After her, we'll have Dr. Akeem Walker come up from First Baptist Powellville, Powellsville in Powellsville, North Carolina. He says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's give them a hand clap of praise as they come in that order. Hallelujah. Oh, that's much better. Can we clap our hands for Jesus one more time? Hallelujah. I count it an honor and a privilege to be in God's house on this Good Friday. How about you? I honor Pastor Mariner and his lovely wife and to all of the preachers and to everyone who is in the house. I also honor my mom who is with me tonight. Wave your hand, mom. I always appreciate her being with me. Um, I'll be reading from the gospel according to Luke, St. Luke, chapter 23, and I'm going to read, if I may, verses 32 through 34. And the word of the Lord reads this way from the New Revised Standard Version. Two others also were criminals, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus with the criminals, one on the right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say thanks be unto God. For the time that is mine, I want to speak from the thought, a puzzling crossword, a puzzling crossword. Have you ever found yourself engaged in an intense and extreme challenge of trying to identify that one word? perhaps the first or the last word to a crossword puzzle that would not let you rest. The kind of battle, the kind of struggle with this one word that could either start your journey to the finish line or cause you to surrender and forfeit your completion of the task for failure to follow through with it. Some of you can identify with what I'm sharing while others are not so familiar. For anyone who does not understand this concept of a simple crossword puzzle, because we are in an age of technology and more modern day games, a crossword puzzle is a puzzle consisting of a grid of some shaded in squares and blank squares in which words crossing vertically and horizontally are written according to clues. Some people love them. They relish the art of sitting, meditating, using their critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, uh -huh, maybe even methods of process of elimination in order to unfold each letter that leads to the hidden word and ultimately completion of the puzzle. 
On the contrary, there are others who have great disdain for crossword puzzles because they find it challenging to use the context clues given with each number to assist them in determining the answer. Perhaps it's their ability to exercise patience and endurance in seeing the process through that causes them to quit and not continue the challenge. Crosswords, believers, can be puzzling. They are not, I may suggest, for the faint at heart. They can seemingly appear impossible, but they can be executed successfully. Although crosswords became popular in the early 1900s, it is the writer of this text, the author Luke, who provides us with an intense moment of the puzzling conundrum of a crossword. The scene is set, can't you see it? Jesus has endured an extreme night and morning of interrogation, abuse, embarrassment, dehumanization. Jesus has been mocked, abused, made a complete spectacle, and now he hangs on a cross between two thieves, watching the Roman soldiers continue their torture. Jesus is naked, bloody, wounded, and the first word in the puzzle, uh-huh, or phrase that he utters is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. What a puzzling phrase. What a perplexing response to the clues of pain and anguish. It is here that we understand that Luke is the creator of this puzzle because he is the only one who records this first saying of Jesus Christ. The clues surrounding this verse, if we think about a crossword puzzle, uh -huh, should offer words like vengeance and retribution and punishment. Can't you see the clues on the puzzle? Luke, who writes to a Gentile Christian community and an unknown community of believers, which are you and I, uh -huh. He does this to show us that sometimes our assignments in life requires cross moments. Cross moments that require us to do one thing that can only either hinder our progress or empower our present and our future. I'm talking about the one word called forgiveness. Believers, in life we will all be faced with some form, some type of cross moment. And in the times that we are faced with cross moments, we have to know the right words to use. And when I speak of cross moments, I'm speaking more specifically to the art of forgiveness. This is a word that we wrestle with, just like the puzzle, a word that sometimes, although the clues could be all around us, we have a difficult time with coming to the conclusion of forgiveness. But Luke here helps us to understand, through the words of Jesus, what we must know and understand when it comes to forgiveness and the benefits of forgiving. Forgiveness exemplifies relationship. God says, Jesus says, excuse me, Father, forgive them. What we must understand about the author Luke is that Luke is all about not only showing history and he is the great physician, but he's one who wants to paint the picture, the picture of the father-son relationship. Uh, Luke's paradigm or uh, perspective focuses on restoration. And it is here that in this aspect of forgiveness, Luke shows us that in order to forgive, you have to be in relationship. It is the relationship that one has with the Father that empowers them to be able to forgive. How could a bloody Jesus, a pain-filled Jesus, a Jesus who is hurt, a Jesus who can barely get words out of his mouth in the midst of all that is happening in the front of those who is tormenting him, utter the words, Father, Forgive him, forgive them. And what's so interesting about this here is that here it is, Jesus exchanges authority. 
it taps into his humanity because initially, here it is in Luke 5, when the man was lame, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And in chapter 7, when there was a woman who was sinful, came kneeling down to Jesus with the alabaster box, Jesus said, woman, your sins are forgiven. But now in our text, Jesus is no longer saying, it is what I will do. Now he's given the authority to his relationship. And can I suggest this may not have been what Jesus felt, but sometimes it's only God that can help you to forgive some unforgivable stuff. In the rough places of life, it's not men, it's not women, but it's God who empowers us to forgive those who don't even ask for forgiveness. It's those that we have to ask for forgiveness for who do not know what they are doing. Jesus is able to do this because of his relationship with his father. Secondly, forgiveness embraces inclusivity. I got to hurry up. Forgiveness embraces inclusivity. Here it is. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Them. God have mercy on them. We understand that them is a plural objective pronoun. Calling the people or referring to them as objects, the people, the Roman soldiers, those who are persecuting and torturing and abusing him, them, forgive them for they know not what they do. He asked forgiveness for them, but he does not change his position. Here it is, it embraces inclusivity and this is something that we struggle with because oftentimes as it relates to forgiveness, we want to forgive those who ask for forgiveness. As it relates to forgiveness, we only want to forgive those who seem sorrowful. We have a difficult time forgiving the oppressor when the oppressor is still walking around like everything is fine. But when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, he's not only talking about the Roman soldiers and even the crowd who decided to crucify him, he is simply talking to a community that was unborn but yet resides today. The community is you and I, a community that did not know we needed God, a community that did not know we needed Christ, but yet Christ died for us. Finally, forgive Forgiveness propels our posture. Forgiveness propels our posture. Here it is, after all that was said and done, Jesus asking them, asking the Father to forgive them for they know not what they do. He simply does not change his position because he has mercy on them. He does not change his posture because uh, he feels sympathy for them. Uh, he knew who he was in his identity. Uh, he had already proven himself during the work of his ministry, and so he did not have to come down just uh, to ask for forgiveness for them. Can I tell you, sometimes people will discredit your authenticity or your credibility based on your position in life. But when you know who you are in God, in your high place and in your low place, you can maintain your posture knowing that the proof is not on you, but the proof is on God. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgiveness, 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 forgiveness. It exemplifies relationship, it embraces inclusivity, and it propels our posture and pushes us further into purpose. I gotta sit down while this word forgiveness remains forever puzzling and perplexing to countless people and believers. We can never become so absorbed by its complexity. You know, I just don't know how I can or why I should. We must never be so overcome by the complexity of forgiveness that we fail to remember the one who made forgiveness possible vertically 
and horizontally. Jesus connected us back to a God who is high, but will come down where we are and made it possible for us to forgive others to the right and the left of us. I can just shout it to the rooftop. He made it possible for us to forgive those all around us. Can I tell you, forgiveness is strange. It doesn't always make sense. Sometimes you can never find seemingly the right clues to help you put the words in the right category. Oh, it's, it's reckless. The song says, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99, and I couldn't earn it. I couldn't, des I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And whenever we find ourselves in the complexing or the perplexing place of understanding how to forgive and make the puzzle make sense, perhaps we shall remember these words, I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous his grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond all my faults and saw my needs. God bless you. you bow your heads. Father, thank you for the privilege of your word. Would you speak to us now in Jesus' name? Amen. We honor Dr. and Lady Mariner. Would you help me appreciate the set man and woman of this house and to all of the preachers? Luke chapter 23, verses 40 through 43 from the message translation of the word of God. But the other one made him shut up. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He said, don't worry, I will today you will join me in paradise. Would you help me preach my sermon title to your neighbor? Say, neighbor, he left it open for me. That's what I want to preach this evening. He left it open for me. H have you ever rushed to get off work, attempted to make it to your favorite store? All you needed was one item, Dr. Leslie. You knew exactly where the item was in the store only to discover that when you rushed out of your car to get to the door, the door was locked. Have you ever had a taste for your favorite item at your favorite restaurant? All day long you waited to get there, only to get to the restaurant and discover that the kitchen was closed. For those of us who travel, you know what it's like to calculate how much time you need from your house to the airport. You got your carry-on bag, Bishop Jones. You don't need to check a bag. But what you don't account for is how that tunnel is tricky at 264. You breaking all kind of laws to get through the tunnel. You riding in the lane that you don't even have authorization to ride in. You park in the short parking lot at the airport. Jump out. You got TSA pre-check. Make it through security only to get to that gate. And you hear these words, the door is already closed. Or, or, or maybe you're like me, grew up in a small Baptist church where every Sunday after the preacher would preach and during revival, the deacons, Deacon K.O. would walk down the aisle and the preacher would say, the doors of the church are open and the invitation to Christian discipleship is at hand. You can come by Christian experience a candidate for baptism, or by a letter. The problem, though, as a little boy sitting in St. Paul Baptist Church, Dr. Cotton, I would oftentimes think that if the doors of the church were open, then there could be a chance that one day they would be closed. 
And when we come upon this text, that's the scene of our text. These two thieves are sitting, uh, sitting on a cross next to Jesus and they have seemingly, church, uh, missed their chance of salvation. There are no more revivals to be preached. Jesus uh, has healed his last person. There is no more crusades uh, and something happens. All of a sudden, this man who had been a thief and had gotten his due justice starts having a conversation. And in one conversation, all of his bad choices changes the trajectory of his life. Isn't it just like Jesus that he even uses the cross as a moment of conversion? I, 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 he stops dying to save somebody else. They are killing him, but he's saving us. And, and, and for my under 40 crowd, you, you know the chorus to this wonderful song, I ain't playing no games. Every word that I say is coming straight uh, from the heart. So if you're trying uh, to lay in these hands, I'm going to leave. Y'all, come on. I, I, I was just trying to see where y'all going to leave out there by myself. Silk Sonic is talking about leaving the door open for some other act. All the over 45 crowd is lost. Silk Sonic is trying to leave the door open for somebody else, but what this text teaches us uh, is that Jesus is so concerned uh, about sinners uh, that even while I got to die, you can't die the same like me. And this thief, this thief is not like the other thief who says, uh, watch this, you know, it's interesting. Dr. Charity just helped us that when people who deserve forgiveness have the, have the right and the audacity to be arrogant, the one thief says, uh, if you be him, save yourself. But then this other thief says, leave him alone. He doesn't deserve this, but as for you and I, we're getting uh, what I deserve. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. What amazes me, Dr. Wolford, about this is that we don't know what remembering me seems to be. What does that even mean? But what this text teaches us as I hurry to my seat is that even in our decisions, we can't deny him. Okay, what? Even in our bad decisions, you can't deny who God is. And this sermon tonight is for the real people who know that you drank a little bit too much at that party. And when you got home the next morning and woke up, you had to discover that God is a way maker because you know you couldn't have made it home by yourself. I, I need somebody who can testify that who I am and what I've done does not change who he is. Lord, I know I deserve it, but when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Pe people who are dying don't need to be condemned. They need people to have compassion. Lord, help, let me say it again. If I'm already going to hell, don't send me there too soon. <laughs> and Jesus shows us a lesson because Jesus could have said to him, I'm done preaching. You've missed your chance. Come on, you know what it's like after you've already cut off your computer and your manager got the audacity to ask you to do one more thing. <laughs> Jesus could have said, the, the church is closed. I, I'm on my way home. But Jesus says, uh, today. Lord, I wish I had somebody who could shout over today. Yesterday, you were a criminal, but today. Yesterday you were bad, but today, and I need somebody who can testify that between your yesterday and today, you met a God who changed your life. Lord, I'm about to shout myself out my own shoes because watch this. I can't change your decisions, but I can change your destiny. You going to die, but after you die, you ain't going to the same place you were going a, a few hours ago. And is there anybody here who can thank God uh, that we serve a God uh, who will leave the door open for you? I got to let y'all go. There's a story. This little boy who always wanted to meet the king and his daddy on spring break paid all this money to trip to take them to see the royal palace. Only problem was when they got there, Pastor Omar, the gate said, closed for business. The father felt like a failure. His son dropped his head 
and started crying. They started walking away from the gate and all of a sudden this stranger grabbed the little boy's hand. And when they started walking back towards the gate, the guards stood at attention. The gate that said closed on it swung open. And all of a sudden the doors to the palace started opening up. The little boy with tears in his eyes looked at the strange man and said, Sir, I've been walking with you all this time. And when we tried to get to the gate, they told us it was closed. Who are you? The man looked back at the little boy and said, I heard that you wanted to see my daddy. And while the gate was closed for you, because you're walking with the son, you got access to the house. Is there anybody here tonight who can testify? You had a whole lot of doors closed, but when you held hands with Jesus, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy we share, would you do me a favor as I go? to my seat and say neighbor a whole lot of people denied me but he left it open for you and I praise the Lord what an honor to be here tonight have you all just enjoyed yourselves in the presence of the Lord I'm grateful for the invitation and help me give God praise for this amazing and down-to-earth leader, Dr. Melvin Mariner, his amazing wife, Lady Mariner, to all the leaders, this amazing music ministry, and to you, the congregation. Help me celebrate my husband who is here. He's fine, but help me to keep my eyes on the cross. Uh, Hallelujah. John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. For the next few moments that are mine, we have to talk about family matters because family matters. As Jesus hangs there shouldering the burden of the world's redemption, knowing that he is about to die, he makes sure that his affairs are in order. Through his suffering and grieving, he still finds time to express his loving concern for his family, namely his mother. I know we've heard it said in relation to miracles, signs, and wonders, but I can't help but ask, what manner of man is this? That while he was in excruciating pain, he wasn't fixated on, all right, let's speed this process up. I got to get out of here. Go ahead and just take me out right now. No, despite the pain that he was experiencing, Jesus was concerned about the pain his mother was experiencing. I know I began to think about a mother who was probably so taken aback by her own sufferings that she didn't think what would be next for her, but Christ did. Consider the fact that she was soon to be a widow known as the mama to that crucified criminal named Jesus. Life could not possibly be easy for her after that. And this is what hit so differently about Jesus to me. Not only was he concerned about her emotional pain, but he was ensuring that even as he hung there dying, that her future security and protection were prioritized. Somebody say he was a good man. A man that wasn't just going to die and say, they'll just have to figure it out without me when I'm gone. A, a man that was making sure his stuff was straight so there would be no unnecessary arguing or falling out or people who randomly came in her life seeking an inheritance when they were nowhere near to be found during his earthly tenure. Jesus was a man who took care of business. I think it needs to be said that just because we are saints and saved and promised wealth and health in the sweet by and by, that does not give us a pass to be absolved of family obligations before we leave this earth. We're talking about family matters because family matters. 
So he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. Well, well, Dr. Leslie, while we're talking about family matters, I wish my son would call me woman. <laughs> From the cross, while he was telling me what to do. But if you read your Bible, you would see that this is not the first time something like this has happened. In John chapter 2, when she asked him to perform a miracle, he said to her, woman, my time has not yet come. What Jesus was doing was not disrespectful. It may sound that way, but you've got to see past face value. First of all, can you even imagine a baby boy crying out mother while he was in pain? What would that even do to a mother? But to take it a step further, what if Jesus' refusal to call her mother, to, instead, to call her woman instead of mother, is consistent with his refusal to prioritize blood relations throughout the gospel? If you look at the life of Jesus, his mission on earth was not geared towards performing miracles, signs, and wonders solely for his immediate family members. In Jesus' mind, it's about a new type of family. It's not about connections, it's about covenant. It's like Jesus is showing us here that he is creating this different type of family, a broader family, the family of God, thus noting Jesus' universal love for all life. As he hang in there in pain, he said to the unnamed son, whom we know as the apostle John, the beloved, son, behold your mother. And as he says this, he's inviting her to look to John, who was with him through it all, to be her son now. And although Jesus was leaving her physically, he knew that John would be the closest resemblance of what he was like in her life. It was John who was at the cross when the others deserted him as he was the only male disciple mentioned and the only one brave enough to stand with the woman who accompanied him at the cross. This brings me to the question, what is your character like? And is your character worth anyone entrusting something or someone to? So Jesus entrusts his mother into the care of John because you don't leave mama with just anybody. Well, well, what about his daddy? Didn't he have a dad? Scholars believe that Joseph, Mary's husband, had already passed by this time. And then traditionally, the oldest son in the family was bound to provide for his mother's care if she became a widow. Well, I get it if Joseph was gone, but what about his bl blood brothers, James, Jude, or another male sibling? Jesus knew, though, that none of his half-brothers were disciples, and yet, while I don't believe he was trying to shade them in any kind of way, how many of you know that sometimes you can have family members that are with you, but that ain't mean they with you? So from what we know, his brothers had not accepted who he was or committed to his mission. They don't believe in him like mama does, and Jesus is not about to give her care that would be less than what she deserved. So while Jesus did not entrust the care of his mother to his blood brothers, he was still fulfilling family responsibility by entrusting her to John. Christ chose John, not out of just the natural, but spiritual concern for his mother. In Jesus' concern for his mother, he does not put her in the care of his natural brothers, but the other side of the family. The family of Jesus now becomes synonymous with those who would follow him, as opposed to those who might have claimed natural familial connection. Jesus uses this moment to redefine and expand our view of families. He teaches us that we have biological families, but we also have covenant families. And before he closed his eyes on this side of heaven, Jesus is still handling business. And I know my word may not have gotten you excited, but this message serves as one of accountability. If you don't get anything else out of this, I need you to see that even while he was dying, family was at the heart of Christ's mission and his ministry. And Jesus shows us what the family of God looks like and how through a relationship with him, we become members of a new family. And so as I get ready to go to my seat, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage us, just like Jesus, to take care of business before you close your eyes. We have to talk about family matters because family matters.
can we give a can we give a hand clap of praise for all of our speakers who have gone thus far? Amen. I want you to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. I certainly honor God tonight for our senior leadership, for our senior pastor, Dr. Melvin Mariner, and the leading lady of this house, Captain Shelley Mariner. Amen. Amen. I, I want to preference my presentation with this before I get started tonight. Uh, I have been given permission. I am going to give a spoken word piece um, as Jesus in the third person to give his psychology on the cross. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, at about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This spoken word piece is going to be entitled, Why Did You Abandon Me? I tried to get out of this in the garden. I was obedient even unto death, and yet when I really needed to feel you, all I felt was disconnect. I did everything you asked of me, even as all these soldiers mock and laugh at me. They cast lots for my clothes while all of my foes take jabs at me. How can you be so casual during this casualty? Actually, what I really want to know is, Father, are you, are you mad at me? Is this all because I asked to please let this cup pass from me? I don't want to engage in blasphemy. But if I stayed attached to this rugged cross, the least that you can do would stay attached to me. But you gave your back to me. You gave me free will, and I freely willed myself to just give it back to thee. I'm, I'm innocent, but you feel no guilt for how your presence has not sat with me? I know, I know, I know. I'm Jesus the Christ. I'm the anointed one, the appointed one. It's clear who I am, but this is a confused cry from your only son. I know when I state this for centuries, theologians are going to debate this. Father, why have you forsaken me? When I chose not to forsake this, I know I said nevertheless, but nevertheless, I can't take this. I can face what was in the cup, but I never wanted to face this. But you told me to embrace this. I wanted to be high and lifted up, but I got a beat down and a facelift. Feeling abandoned by you is really making me hate this. I had a palate for what was in the cup, but I really didn't want to taste this. I got to stomach the sin of this world. Every bigot, every racist, every liar, every cheater, every deceiver, every rapist, every hate crime, every white lie, the big sins, the basics. Oh, now it's starting to make sense. It's all this sin that's on me that's got us feeling so spacious. When, when John dipped me in that water and I came up dripping and the spirit likened to a dove started descending. You said, you said, you said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And everybody can hear you. Now I'm tripping with the sin of this world and I can't even get near you. They were just screaming Hosanna as I set the tone for Holy Week. Well, OMG, I kept it holy, but I can't feel your Holy Spirit holding me. I told the disciples, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father, but right now, it's only me. This separation, it's, it's burning a hole in me. Can't you send the comforter? Because I can't sense you consoling me. This is ruining me. I know this is being recorded, so I don't want there to be any ambiguity. How I was handled? Brutally. I mean, the cross was brutal, but I had no idea what being separated from you would do to me. So look at what not letting this cup pass from me has landed me. I'm nailed to a cross screaming out, Father, why have you abandoned me? 
This is my story. It's, it's gory and it's very far from scenic. And even though I feel depleted, this isn't a whimper from a man who's been defeated. I mean, my lungs are collapsing and I feel a little weakened, but though he slay me now, just wait until after the weekend. Uh, I got a few more sayings left uh, until I'm done saving these heathens. Uh, and when they quote my last sayings, uh, they better quote me as King Jesus. Come on, somebody give God praise right here. You can do better than that. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we greet you in Jesus' name, the one to whom we all bow and serve. To our beloved pastor, Dr. Mariner, to Lady Mariner, to my wife and my daughter who are here, we thankful to God for this opportunity and experience. As I, I went out a few moments ago, I, I had called Portsmouth Police Department and uh, I have taken out warrants for the arrest of Fisher, <laughs> Walker, McClendon, and Burton. Amen. Amen. But I am happy that I'm before Cotton and Jones. I know what all of them can do. We thank God for their blessings and their service. St. John's chapter 19, verse 28 from the King James Version of God's Word. The record says, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. You may be seated in his presence. Father, anoint us now. Fill us with your spirit. Guide our tongue with your grace. In Jesus' name. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I need a drink. Look on the other side, tell them, don't judge me, but I need a drink. We have come tonight and we have engaged in this Calvary conversation. We've heard Jesus beg forgiveness for those that were around the cross, killing him for no reason of his own. And I'll be honest with you tonight, I don't, I don't know if I could have been as strong as Jesus was. Even in a moment of dying, he, he asked for forgiveness for those that were killing him. Had I had the power that Jesus had to open his mouth and yet take the life of every one around the cross, I don't know if I would have given up that power for those that were doing me wrong, but thank God Jesus did. He stops dying to give paradise enrollment to two thieves that were guilty. He stops dying even furthermore, Pastor Cotton, to leave his mother in good hands as he leaves. He got to take care of family matters because it's a family business. He feels this anguish, uh, Pastor Mariner, he feels this anguish and he cries out in his Hebraic tongue, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, God, why? You sent me to come and I've come why have you left me by myself? But I know that in my spirit I'm glad because as we approach this word, 
of need. The master has hung there all of these hours. He, he has been given nothing to drink, nothing to eat. Surely his body is suffering from dehydration. But the scripture says, after this. That's what I like about it. After this, we're going to be all right. The scripture says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, the scripture might be fulfilled. He says, I thirst. I, I need a drink, but, but not, not the world's libation. Not, not those things of the world that give us peace and sometimes comfort. I don't know but for myself personally, but I've heard, so let me just call a list. I know you, I know you holy, sanctified, free from sin, so don't let nobody know what's, what really goes on when you're not in church. So don't lift up your hand, don't shout too loud, but they tell me it's, it could be C-Rock. Cavassier, Hennessy, gin, vodka. And let's be honest with ourselves, if drinking was going to send anyone to hell, there'd be a long line. Because there's, there's nothing wrong with having a glass of wine every now and then. Pink Moscato. Peach snaps. Well, let's go on back home. Mad Dog 2020. Jack Daniels. Johnny Walker, red and black. But this is not what the master needed. He was thirsting, beloved, because he needed to feel that relationship with God. And my brothers and sisters, we are in the same condition as the Savior. Because we're thirsting for that, that will, man's libation will not satisfy. If we had, if he had taken a drink of the vinegar placed on the hyssop, where would we be tonight? So I hasten to a close here tonight. I stopped by just to share with you. I need a drink. I need to feel the master love. I don't need a drink of water, but I need a drink of Jesus. I need the Lord to stop by every now and then and see about me. I thirst for the Father's love. I thirst for his Holy Ghost power. I thirst for him to walk with me and talk with me. I thirst for him to move in my life. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that I can drink of him. I'm so glad that he make a way for me. Y'all excuse me now, but I'm starting to feel good here. I'm glad that every time I turn around, he's making ways for me. Every time I turn around, he's walking with me. He's telling me it's going to be all right. He's telling me that he's opening up the windows. He's making me my enemies my footstool. Can you say yeah? Can you say yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I need a drink. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Amen. 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 And a man. I don't like that guy. <laughs> Amen. Blessings to my brother, Dr. McLaughlin. Amen. I'm always put under pressure. I'm glad you all got your shout out the way. But to my pastor, my friend, <laughs> uh, my ministry father, confidant, frat brother, as well as his leading lady, thank you. To my Grove family, there's no place like home. To my New Genesis family, as I saw a few of you tonight, as well as online, God bless you as well. And my wife is with me tonight, Reverend Lakeisha Cotton. But if you will listen to me for a few moments, I'm preaching from the 29th, or excuse me, the 19th chapter of the gospel according to John. I'll be starting at the 29th verse, concluding at the 30th verse, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard rendering of God's word, and it reads like this. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. God, give me preaching power and give your people shouting power. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. I like to preach from the subject. I'm finished with this. I'm finished with this. I didn't come tonight to shout you. I came more so to argue John's case. The gospel according to John is the only gospel that records this sick saying, this sick expression of Jesus but in my summation, John is the only gospel writer suitable and qualified to put pen to parchment and make mention of this statement. It is finished. I say this because amongst the other gospel writers, John is an anomaly. Not being a synoptic writer, gospel writer, John stands in a class of his own. I even like how he presents his case proves his case. And then with Jesus dying, he closes his case. He did not write to a specific ethnicity or culture. Neither did he portray Jesus as any earthly related thing, like a king, humble servant, or perfect man, with a Tanakh or Old Testament historical state of mind. Wyatt for Revelation, John takes us back to where it all started. This is why he starts his gospel with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he says, the same was in the beginning with God, speaking of Jesus. Then he explains a few verses later that the Word manifested in the flesh, and not only did it manifest in the flesh, but it dwelled among us being who we know as Jesus the Christ. With such statements of revelation, John was letting us know that Jesus was there when God created everything. Somebody say everything. But it's in chapter three, John emphatically expressed that John, that Jesus is more than a king, humble servant, or perfect man because he is the only begotten son, which lets the world know that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. 
Oh, uh, y'all got to excuse me. I told you I came to argue tonight. Dr. Meredith, in my studies, this expanded my view of this sixth expression. I found myself questioning the true age of Jesus and who, rather, what was speaking the words, it is finished. Was he really 33 and a half years old? And was it his humanity or his divinity speaking? I got it though. His flesh was 33 and a, and a half, but inside of him there was a divinity that existed that was much older than that. Uh, I tried to put a number on it, but I came out with an age of about what's called infinity. And not only was he infinity years old, but he came to fix a problem that was around long before any of us were born. Y'all know that problem, that problem that started in a garden called Eden. We can't really relate to his divine nature, but because of his humanity, suffering touched with the feeling of our infirmities, and in all points, he was tempted. We are more so able to relate to his humanity. His divinity was saying it is finished, referring to the propitiation of sin was taken care of. However, we gotta deal with this 33 and a half year old body. This 33 and a half year old humanity was saying it is finished, relating not to propitiation, but to problems and process. I believe that all of us can relate to problems and process. It is a part of our human condition and experience. So in all actuality, Jesus was really saying, I'm finished with this. All of us have or had a this in our lives. A this in our lives is descriptive of the difficult moments and tough situations that we face on this journey called life. I don't know specifically what your this may be, but all of us have them. Cancer is a this. A rough marriage or divorce is a this. The challenges faced when raising a child on your own is a this. Being laid off from the job is a this. The pain of losing a loved one is a this. COVID-19 is a this. Depression is a this. Stress, heart issues, high blood pressure, diabetes when our children act up, having a boss that gets on our last nerve, backed up bills, racism, backstabbing friends, drug addiction, alcoholism, the car breaking down, and all the other ailing vicissitudes of life that come with life are a this. So with all that said, is there anybody in the room tonight, anybody under the sound of my voice that has ever experienced a this in life? Oh, you can sit there and act like you've never had a this in your life. But in the words of my father, Melvin Cotton Sr., just keep living and whatever you do, don't die. And I guarantee you some type of this is going to come your way. Well, excuse my lengthy preamble, but this premise of this pericope is we all have experienced a this, even our Jesus. Let me say it like this. This is a sour moment. The this is that we face in life are moments that are sour. When something is sour, it triggers our taste receptors found on our taste buds, causing us to make weird, unbecoming, and strange faces. Well, my family, church, life is like this. Life has a way of making us walk around with some strange emotions making us walk around with some weird faces and sometimes unbecoming spirits. But there's some good news tonight. At the time of the text, Jesus is hanging on the cross. 
after all he had gone through in life, he's now in a sour situation. Throughout his life, he experienced poverty, not being understood, people not acknowledging who he was, friends dying, a hit out on his life when he was a baby. I can't tell it all tonight, but that is to tell you and let you know that all of us, even Jesus, has gone through a this. Sometimes life throws things your way, things that you were not expecting and they come up and you understand and you realize that this is a sour moment, but as long as you hold on to God, you will get through your this. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but I believe there are some people here tonight who God really wants to realize that it, this is time for you to declare, declare, I am finished with this. Well, church, there's a relevant question tonight. After I answer this question, I promise I will take my seat. But the relevant question on the night is how do we know we are finished with our this? The first thing the text exposes to us in regard to how we know that we are finished with our this is God gives us the strength to withstand sour, suffering situations. Uh, let's look at the text. Uh, verse 29 starts off by telling us the sour vinegar is sitting in front of Jesus. And he knows that he is in the midst of a sour situation. But all that Jesus had already gone through in his life, it prepares him for his this moment. What I'm saying to you all at night is everything you've gone through in your life, everything you've experienced to make it to this existential moment was God preparing you for your this. You may be saying, Brother Cotton, I've already gone through my this. You may be saying, Brother Cotton, I've already gone through some things, but I promise you, if you just keep living, uh, that you're going to realize you haven't gone through anything yet uh, because a this, if it's not happening, is on the way. I'm almost there. Secondly, the text tells us not only will, will God give us the strength to withstand Stand sour suffering situations, but God also adds sweetness to our sour situations. Ah, I'm going to stop right here for a moment because what I'm trying to tell you is that also in verse 29, Jesus is giving some hyssop. Now, hyssop was a plant that has a minty, sweet taste. So what the text is telling us that is that when we are in the midst of a sour situation, that God will send some sweet things along with it. Oh my God, what are you talking about, preacher? See, see, whenever you taste something sour, whenever your body, your mouth encounters something sour, it, 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 it reacts your taste buds to have you make those weird faces. Many of you probably didn't notice, but the way you get rid of a sour taste is you need something sweet. Ah, God gave us something sweet a long time ago and that is our sweet Jesus. Uh, but the last thing that after God gives us something sweet along with our sour situation is God gives us the strength I like this right here God gives us the strength to speak after our soury, suffering situations. What I mean by this is some sour situations in life feel as if they have not the life out of us. But here it is in verse 30, after saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. After Jesus says that, then he says, today you shall be with me in paradise. He goes on to keep talking and say, woman, behold thy son and son behold thy mother but then he feels all alone and says my God my God why hast thou forsaken me then he says I thirst and now they give a wearied parched mouth Jesus something sour to drink but he still mustered up enough strength to say it is finished, which means I'm finished with this. Uh, much like Jesus, you and I have gone through a lot of hell in this thing called life. I don't know what you've already dealt with or what you're dealing with right now, but God said while you are still hanging in there, 
Ah, uh, just like Jesus there, he want us to speak those things that are not as though they are and shout, I'm finished with this. Oh, y'all ain't got it yet. See, somebody needs to say, cancer treatments, I'm finished with this. Trying to pay this car off and my money is funny, I'm finished with this. Ah, uh, trying to catch up on my bills, but I'm going to call it out right now and say, I'm finished with this. Oh, I got student loans, but I'm finished with this. Maybe you've come down on your luck and you're dealing with a bankruptcy, but God wants you to say, I'm finished with this. Depression, foreclosure, suffering from past trauma, insecurity, and fake friends. All you got to do is look the devil in his face and say, I'm finished with this. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. Maybe you're not dealing with anything, but I have a this in my life. But I'm excited tonight because just like God got me through a this in the past, God will get me through a this right now. I don't know about you, but, but, but the this that I dealt with in the past is what built me up for the this right now. Is there anybody here willing to give God some praise and speak it now before the battle is over and say, this, I'm finished with this. If you're here tonight and you can declare that you're finished with stand to your feet and give God some praise. Oh, some of y'all sitting there like you're going to come through on your own might. Some of you sitting there like, like, like God is not the author and the finisher of your faith. But I've lived long enough to realize that I didn't get through anything on my own and you're not going to get through anything on your own, but it's going to take you and God to get through it. So if you're here tonight and you totally understand that, let me hear you say, I'm finished with this. You're not saying it like you mean it. You're saying it like you're scared of something. But many of you are from the city of Portsmouth or the surrounding area, so I know you're not scared of anything, but you need to let the enemy know, I'm through with this. I'm through with not being able to sleep every night. I'm through with taking medication just to go to sleep. I'm through with drinking myself to sleep. You know why? Because I'm finished with this. No longer I'm going to allow people to take advantage of me. Why? Because I'm finished with this. No longer will I walk out into the world with insecurities because I'm finished with this. Amen. 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 Give God some praise. Keep in your spirit. I'm finished with this. Oh, come on, let's give God some praise. You heard Dr. Rodney McLaughlin said, I need a drink. And then we had my brother, Dr. Melvin Cotton say, I'm finished with him. Let's give them a hand clap of praise. Look at somebody and say, we got one more, we got one more, we got one more, we got one more. God isn't finished yet. And this time we're going to have our last expression. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is going to be Bishop James Jones from Greater Grace Church in Portsmouth, from Portsmouth, Virginia. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise as he comes. to Dr. Mariner and Lady Mariner, to the Grove Church, we bless God for you, to all of those instruments of inspirations and vessels of victory that have gone before me, to my family that is present and to the Greater Grace Church that is sprinkled among us. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. The Lord our God is good. Do me a favor, if you don't mind, his heads are bowed, his eyes are closed. God bless the person on my left, my right, my front and my back. And while on others, thou art calling. Do not pass me by. In the only name that really matters, 
in the name that loved us so much that he died but was too incredibly strong to stay dead and because he lives we can all face tomorrow it's in that name that we do pray and they all said amen if you would come on rest on your feet beloved go with me to luke 23 luke 23 and i'll be reading from the new international version of the bible Dr. Mariner, uh, verse 44 through 46, the text says, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. 46 says, Jesus, Charity called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, when he said this, he breathed his last. As you go to your seat, those of y'all that are watching virtually tonight, I need you to find somebody and tell them I'm prepared to die. You may rest in your seats in the presence of the eternal. For the next few moments, I want to hang my hat, Ray, homiletically, Lisa, and tag this text theologically from this thought. I'm prepared to die. Omar, on April 20th, 1964, from the descendants dock at the Rovani trial, Nelson Mandela released one of the greatest speeches of the 20th century and a pivotal moment in the history of South African democracy. The three hour speech is entitled, Cotton, I'm Prepared to Die. Homiletically and exegetically, it is impossible Barnes for me to encapsulate three hours of profundity and particularity in 10 minutes. Allow me hermeneutically to cut across the field. Mandela says, during my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to this struggle of the African people. I fought against Janelle white domination and I fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society where all persons live together in harmony with equal opportunities. It is an ideal that I hope to live for and I hope to achieve. But if not, it is an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. And I know tonight you're wondering what Mandela and this final saying of Jesus from the cross, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit when he says this and breathes his last. What does this have to do with us in Grove tonight, physically and virtually? I'm glad you asked, beloved. Here it is. Scholar Walter Brueggemann argues it is the crucifixion barns of of Jesus. That is a strong criticism a team of royal consciousness. The crucifixion of Jesus is not to be understood simply in good liberal fashion as the sacrifice of a noble man. Nor should we too quickly assign a cultic priestly theory of atonement to the event. Instead, we might see in the crucifixion of Jesus the ultimate act of prophetic criticism in which, Darrell, Jesus announces the end of a world of death and takes the death into his person. So who does the Father declare that he is at this moment? Jesus says, Father, I commit my spirit. Evangelist Mo, in a world filled and driven by competence, competition, criticism, and control. I've only got one point tonight. Jesus' death dismantles and decisively dismisses 
every self-serving form of power upon which our consciousness is based. Here it is, in other words, the self-giving emptiness of Jesus is about dominion through the loss of dominion, about fullness coming only by self-emptying. The emptying of a one who was willing to surrender power for obedience sake is the one thing kings cannot do and yet remain kings. Here it is, beloved. Persons have theologically and exegetically done an amazing job, Dr. Merlin, over the last TP 2,000 years. Daryl, for unpacking this passage. And I've preached and wrestled with this text for years. I could see Monique, Jesus' undying connection to his father. I could see JP, Jesus' reliance and dependence on the capable hands of his father because there were no other hands he could exclusively trust. However, what I missed in the text was the etymological significance of commend in the King James and commit in the NIV. Watch this. There are many definitions of the word commend or commit. However, Lady Shelley, out of all of them, the one that speaks to me the most is to put into a place of preservation, to deposit or to commit a passage in a book to memory. But watch this grove and I'm done. To commit the body to the grave. This, Dr. Walker, is where we get our word committal. That is done at the burial of our deceased loved ones. Victims of the crucifixion usually die slow deaths. But Jesus, charity being in control, surrendered not only his soul, but surrendered his commitment to God. I'm done, y'all. Thank you, Mandela, for dying for us. Thank you, Jesus, for reminding us not only how to live, but also how to die. Nobody but Jesus would preach his own eulogy with the first six words and do his committal with the seventh word. Nobody but Jesus, while dying on a cross, would be able to say, inasmuch as it is pleasing to Almighty God, in his providential wisdom, I commit my body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust, looking for the general resurrection in the last day when those of us who die in the Lord shall be raised to eternal glory with him. I'm done, y'all, but turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, but the centurion shows us what to do when Jesus dies. He stands back and says, surely he was a good man. Good night, y'all. May the Lord God bless you real good. But is there anybody under the sound of my voice that can open up your mouth and give God a praise? Praise him for waking you up this morning. Praise him for putting food on your table. Praise him for putting clothes on your back. Turn to a neighbor and say, neighbor, this holler ain't for my blessing, 
but this holler is for your blessing at the count of three I want you to holler for what God's getting ready to do in your neighbor's life one for the father two for the son now holler 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 like you about to lose your mind the bible declares let everything let everything let everything let everything that has breath praise ye the lord can i get 29 of y'all to lean your head back and holler he died he died he oh he died Come on, you got 30 seconds. Just go ahead and give them some praise. Come on, because we got to get ready and go home. It's getting late. It's after 9 o'clock. But since we're here, (laughs) the night is still young for a Friday. You ought to give them some glory. Come on, because what then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, (laughs) he's more than the world against us. You want to take some time and give them some glory? Come on, you got 60 seconds. Just go ahead and give them some praise. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. If it had not been for the Lord, who was on my side? You better give them some glory. Because he died for you and me. Come on, slap your neighbor and say, I'm glad he died. I'm glad. I'm glad he died. If he didn't die, I wouldn't be here today. If he hadn't have died, I wouldn't have made it. If he hadn't have died, I wouldn't be able to overcome. I'm grateful for the sacrifice.